Okay. Um, this is going to be a really, really fast lecture. I know some of you have been waiting for hematology, and I apologize that I haven't got this out sooner, and I know time is short. So I'm going to do this lecture, and it's going to be really quick. Um, and then I'm going to do a follow-up lecture that's going to go into a little bit more detail, but I'm probably not going to get that out for um, another day or two. So I just um, I want to get a little bit of information out to you people who are waiting. <clears throat> so this um, next section that we're going to talk about is hematology. And I'm not going to lie, hematology is a little bit complicated. So what I really want you to focus on, rather than getting into the details of is this a, a B lymphocyte or is it a you know lymph, lymphoid or myeloid? Instead of we're focusing on all of that, I want to step back and give you some broad concepts. So because this is one area of medicine where if you know the root word and the suffixes, it will help you tremendously to understand what the heck the disease process is. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, this whole area of heme onc, you'll hear it abbreviated as heme onc, that means hematology oncology. And the breakdown of that is hematology is the um, part of medicine that deals with blood disorders. Um, so any, any disorder of the blood, and there can be a lot of them, so if you'll remember... Remember from um, anatomy, the blood is made up of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, and plasma. The plasma is the liquid part of the blood. The red blood cells carry the oxygen. The white blood cells, um, there's and there's several kinds of white blood cells. Um, there's you know the the lymphocytes, the um, myeloids. The there's there's Four to four or five, four different kinds, um, and they're responsible for fighting infection. Uh, the platelets are responsible for clotting and bleeding. The plasma part is responsible for producing immunoglobulins, which also help um, fight off um, infection, bacteria and stuff. So, so that is. Um, blood in a nutshell. So that's hematology. So if there's a disorder in any of that, you would go see a hematologist. And then they, they link oncology with that, but it's the when you say hemonc, it's not every single kind of cancer would go to a hemonc doctor. The oncologists in, in hemonc do the blood-borne cancers, and there are cancers that arise in the blood, specifically like the leukemia, um, lymphoma, those are the big ones that we're really going to talk about, but, but if you get a cancer in the blood, then you would go see the hemonc doc, the hem hematology oncology doctor. If you have cancer somewhere else, like let's say you have ovarian cancer, you're going to start out at your um, gynecologist's office, and then you would see a gynecological surgeon, um, and the gynecology team would then handle the cancer. You wouldn't go see a hemoc doctor for a gynecological problem. So every part of medicine that, that is specialized, cancer can develop in there, but they have um, physicians and surgeons trained to deal with cancer of that area. So when you hear this, this heme onc, that's hematology, oncology, it's, that means, most often means um, blood-borne cancers. Okay, the next thing that I want to talk about, some things that you need, the overview in hematology. This, I made, I made a little poster. I'll stand up so you can see it. This is one, um, area of medicine where it's really, really helpful, and I know you guys didn't get um, a class in this, but it's really helpful to understand your pre prefixes and suffixes because then you can kind of understand um, what somebody is talking about. At least you can kind of surmise it from the words. So things that I want you to know, is that in the thing? Let's, these over here are some precept, prefixes and suffixes that I've written down for you. Hemo, H-E-M-O, 
means blood. So if you see hemo in front of anything, it means blood. This word can also be H-E-M-A, hema, also means blood, or hema two, to like H-E-M-A-T-O, hemato, also just means blood. So there's a couple different variations, but if you see this root suffix hemo in front, that means you're dealing with blood. Phila, P-H-I-L-I-A, the Latin uh, word, the Greek word for that, that means love. Um, so phila, love. So if you have a hemophilia, that basically just means, um, you know, they're... Um, you love blood, and there, but there's way too much of it. it it's a bleeding disorder. There's the, I, you know, you love blood so much, you're overdoing it. Hemophilia, it's a bleeding, a uh, bleeding disorder. This suffix thrombo, t h r o m b o, means clot. So if you see the word thrombo in front of something, that means clot. It can also mean platelets, but platelets, you know, lead to clotting. So thrombo is clot. Stasis, S-T-A-S-I-S. -S. Stasis just means something is standing still. Um, so a thrombostasis is a clot that's not moving. It's a, it's a stable clot, thrombostasis. Osis, O-S-I-S, -S, just means a condition. It, it does not necessarily mean a bad condition. It's just a condition. So um, if you see the word like homeostasis, um, no, not, no, that's not, that's stasis. Um, okay, I can't think of one right now, but I'm going to come back to that because I'm in a rush and a little panic for time. Um, if you see the suffix pathy, P-A-T-H-Y, that means a disease. So osis, O-S-I-S, -S, can just be a condition. It, it might be a disease, but it might just be a state of order. Pathy is always a disease condition. If you see the suffix pathy, P-A-T-H-Y, that is an abnormality 100% of the time. Penia, P-E-N-I-A, if you see the, the suffix penia at the end of a word, that means it's lacking something. So you can have apnea, um, a-P-E-N-A -E is like lack of breathing. Um, leukopenia, leuko is um, the leukocytes, part of the white blood cells. Penia, not enough white blood cells. Um, thrombocytopenia, um, thrombo being clot, cyto is a vessel, penia, um, like not enough platelets in the vessel. So thrombocytopenia is not enough um, platelets, you're going to have a bleeding disorder. Um, lysis, L-Y-S-I-S, -S, is a breakdown of clots. So you can have fibrinolysis. Fibrin um, is um, part of the clotting cascade. You need to set down fi like fibers, basically, in order to start that clot. Fibrinolysis is a breakdown of clot, um, which sometimes you want. If you, have, if you have a thrombus, if you have a clot there, you want to give, like you want, maybe you want to give a fibrinolytic agent that'll help break down the clot. So lysis or lytic, L-Y-T-I-C, lysis, same thing, breaking down a clot. I don't know if you can see this. I think I've, um, let me, with my stuff. Um, hopefully you can see that. Um, cyto. C-Y-T-O means vessel. So, so like I, I think I gave that example already of a um, thrombocytopenia, not enough platelets. Um, it, it's just in the bloodstream. Cyto is, is just a vessel. Um, so you'll see that we're a lot. Poesis, P-O-I-E-S-I-S, -S, poesis, just means the production of something. So you might see the word um, hematopoesis. Meaning, meaning production of blood cells, production of cells, of, of blood cells, um, hematopoiesis. Um, the other things, sometimes sometimes you'll see these at the end of a word too. So if you see E-M-I-A, emia, at, at the end of a word as a suffix, that also means blood. So you can have um, um, poly, meaning too many, cythemia. Um, emia is, is blood cells, so that means you have too many red blood cells, polycythemia, red blood cells um, in the vessels, um, too many of them. 
Neo, if you see that word Neo, N-E-O, that means new. Um, but typically you'll see that word related to malignancies. And, and usually in healthcare, if you see that knee, Neo, um, like you can have like a neoplasm, that is another word for a, like a cancer, a, a malignancy, a neoplasm. Neoplastic, this word plastic is like formation off. So if you see this word neoplastic, it's a formation of a tumor. Um, so those, I mean, those are not necessarily good things, but you need to know, you need to know these words. You need to understand these precept, prefixes and suffixes. Because if you put them together, then you can understand what we're talking about. Mostly in hematology, you either have too much or something that's causing the problem or not enough of it that can cause, you know, different problems. The other thing that I want you to know, this is really important in hematology, you have to understand uh, the um, diagnostics, the uh, serological studies, and by that I mean serum, meaning the blood work, that is really important when you are taking care of a patient who has a hematology disorder. So these are the key um, serological diagnostic um, studies that we get. The lab values is what I'm talking about. So PTT is the partial thromboplastin time, PTT. You get a PTT level if your patient is on heparin. Heparin is used short term. It's only used in the hospital or in a controlled setting. Patients don't go home on heparin because the bleeding risks are too high. So PTT is drawn. It's drawn a lot in the hospitals, not drawn a lot in the outpatient setting because the patient shouldn't be on heparin at home. Um, so normal PTT range should be between 25 and 35. Sometimes if your patient has... Um, you, you want them um, anti-coagulated, -coag you don't want them to bleed as much, you want, might want this number to go up a little bit, um, but these are your therapeutic ranges, it's called a therapeutic range, when somebody is on heparin, you're going to draw their PTT. Now, in the past, the other one that we got was the prothrombin time, um, and the PT, the normal is 17, but you don't have to remember that one very much because they've now come up with something called the International um, Normalized Ratio, and it's a little bit of a tighter measure of um, what the clotting is doing in the blood on your pa in your patients who are receiving warfarin. Warfarin and Coumadin are interchangeable, and those are long-term anticoagulant drugs. Those are the drugs that somebody will go home on and the patients who have um, blood clots, um, they're high risk for clotting, things like that, they're going to go home on Coumadin or, or Warfarin, same thing. And then those patients, you're going to follow their INR, their International Normalized Ratio. And this, the nor normal is one. Like if, you, if you're not on an anticoagulant, meaning heparin, Coumadin, um, warfarin, aspirin, if you're not on one of those kinds of things, it should be one. But sometimes you want that number to be higher. And usually you'll want it at about, at about a two to three if your patient is on warfarin, because then you know that they are um, not as high risk to develop clots. But those patients, any patient who is, is going home on warfarin or Coumadin needs to have these numbers checked fairly frequently. Like, it, you know, it depends on how uh, fragile they are, but anywhere between every two to every six months, they need to come and have these drawn because, heaven forbid, that nobody gets this value and all of a sudden it's going way up. And if their INR is all of a sudden six and they fall down and bump their head, they're going to bleed out because, because the... Um, their Coumadin levels are way too high. So that's why these numbers are important to follow because you don't want them so high that somebody's actually bleeding out. The other thing that you need to um, know is platelets. Platelets, very important number to know. That should be 150 to 300. Um, patients that, that have too high platelets have a higher risk for clotting. Patients that have really low platelets have high risk for bleeding. So that's why these numbers are very important. So I do want you to know those from my little chart that I made. Um, so um, the next thing that I wanted to talk about before we get into the actual, um, the 
these actual disorders themselves is um, heparin and Coumadin. So those are going to be in chapter 33, because chapter 34 is all the malignancies. So chapter 34, and I should have looked this up ahead of time, um, exactly where this is. Maybe I put it in my notes. <coughs> Um, I didn't put in my notes what page it's on. Probably about 900 and something. Um, okay, so, I don't know. I don't know where it is. I don't know. I'll find it. So, I'll just tell you, um, uh, the things I want you to know about is, is um, heparin, coumadin, and warfarin are the two big ones that we're going to talk about. And when we're, um, your, your patient's, in the hospital, everybody and their brother is on heparin short term because it's a really good um, drug to help prevent clots. And as you know, like we've talked about, your patients who are in the hospital, laying in bed, not moving, um, they are static. There's that word stasis again. They're static. They're not moving. They have um, higher risk for developing clots. So they usually get like a low dose heparin. Um, so the the it's called um, unfractionated heparin, and if I'd been a little more organized, I would have had this ready for you. It's called unfractionated heparin. Um, it's used short term, usually less than four days, um, and it's measured, again, by the PTT thing. Um, and the therapeutic usually is, um, you know, about, about one and a half to two times what a normal clotting would be. And so that's just something that's used in the hospital. Then um, Coumadin, oh yeah, I found it. Um, yeah, it's pharmacological therapy. I'm, I'm looking at page um, 396 in your textbook now, and it describes in there um, heparin and Coumadin slash warfarin. The Coumadin, um, I would make sure that you know the chart um, 3312 over on page 3 or 938. Here's the problem with Coumadin, any patients who, are, who go home on Coumadin, is that um, because it has a component um, that involves vitamin K, because you know you need vitamin K to um, help in the clotting cascade, and Coumadin, Warfarin, acts um, on that process of the clotting cascade. So you have to be really careful in your patients who are going home to do a lot of nutrition teaching because you got to tell them what's in um, foods. They have to understand um, what foods have vitamin K in them because it can make the Coumadin, the effect of Coumadin, um, more significant. And your patient can, their, their INR can go up too high or not enough and they can either be at high risk for bleeding or um, higher risk for developing clots. So you need to be very careful. So this chart on um, page 398 chart 3312 gives you an example of all kinds of medications, herbs, other other foods that have vitamin K in it um, that you need to um, teach your patient about before they go home on Coumadin. The other thing that they're coming out with now is it's called low, man, low molecular weight heparin. This is um, different than the unfractionated heparin they get in the hospital. It's a low molecular weight heparin. And there's they're doing quite a bit of trials with it now. Um, and, and they're trying some oral meds. Um, there are some like injections that the patient can try at home. Um, like Lovenox is one of them. Um, the half-life is shorter than regular heparin, which is why it's safer for patients that are at home. Um, so, and there's less chance of um, complications like, like HITS, like heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which we'll talk about probably next time. Um, so that's something that they're kind of playing with. So now, um, the other things I want you to be aware of in hematology is um, hemoglobin and hematocrit. Your hemoglobin and, and hematocrit are associated with your red blood cells because um, it's th those are the oxygen carrying capacities and the iron carrying um, capacities of red blood cells. So you need to also understand 
um, normal hemoglobin and normal hematocrit. These change, there's a range, um, but it changes quite a bit between men and women. So the range for hemoglobin is 12 to 18. Women, like if a man has a hemoglobin of 12, he's getting really, really low. But um, a woman can really get down to about 10 before she's considered you know, low. She'll start feeling the effects of it when she's at 10. Um, so women really should be like 12 to maybe 14. 14 is good for a woman. And men really need to be about, you know, like 14 to 18. So, and, and that's really uh, related to the female menstrual cycle because they lose, um, they lose blood every month during the menstrual cycle. And the same thing with the hematocrit. A hematocrit is the percentage uh, in the blood. And again, it's, it changes between men and women so the normal range there is between like 36 and 42 again men need to be up close to the 42 range um it's important to besides the vitamin k is to these dogs are killing me i'm sorry hopefully you can still hear me um so the other thing that's important in your patients who have hematological disorders is to know the foods that are high in iron because iron will help increase um, patients who are anemic, meaning they have, um, they, they have low hemoglobin, low, um, low hemoglobin, basically. If your hemoglobin's low, you're going to be anemic. Um, and the signs and symptoms of that, you're going to be fatigued, you're going to sometimes be winded, you're going to have to catch your breath because you don't have as much oxygen on the red blood cells that's supposed to be getting to the tissues. That's the whole point of hemoglobin is to carry the oxygen to the tissues. Um, so, and one way to improve your um, hemoglobin and your hematocrit is to eat iron-rich foods. And the iron is found a lot in um, red meats, some fruits like um, peaches, and a lot of the leafy vegetables like um, you know like spinach and kale and things like that. Um, that's the problem. There's somebody right outside. That's what the dogs are barking about. So, um, okay. So the um, I guess, I guess what I want you to take away from this little snippet and introduction to hematology is you have to understand what the red blood cells do, the white blood cells, and the platelets. If you have less of something, like for example, if you have thrombocytopenia, meaning, penia meaning not enough, thrombo being um, like a clot, like, like platelets. If you don't have enough platelets, thrombocytopenia, your patient is not going to clot. So they are at high risk for bleeding. We are gonna go into more details about the bleeding disorders um, like there's von Willebrand's disease, there is hemophilia, um, sickle cell anemia is kind of like that, but sickle cell anemia has to do with um, the shape of the red blood cells. Um, but when your patient doesn't have enough platelets, they are a bleeding risk. So as a nurse, you need to one, teach them how to avoid things that are going to cause um, injury, cause bleeding. Things like shaving with a razor, um, brushing their teeth with a, um, a toothbrush that's too hard. Gums are very vascular, so you switch them to a soft toothbrush, have them not brush too hard, because if they start bleeding, it's harder to get it to stop bleeding, and you don't want to have a bleeding problem. Um, there can be things like there's a disseminated intravascular coagulation problem where the patient doesn't coagulate and so they start oozing and bleeding, which becomes a problem if you have to start an IV on a patient. Your hemophiliacs, 
they can't clot. So, um, and this is that, is that one shows up in little children. So if they fall and, and hurt themselves, all of a sudden they can swell up and start be bleeding. It becomes life threatening. So you also would teach your patient to use all the normal measures that you would for a regular person who's bleeding, compression, ice, but you just have to do it longer and, and, um, and more significantly than for somebody who doesn't have a bleeding disorder. The red blood cells, like polycythemia um, or thalcemia, thalcemia is small red blood cells, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, <clears throat> polycythemia vera, that's one of the malignancies, but it's, it's too much red blood cells. So when you get an overproduction of red blood cells, um, and you'll remember that the blood cells are formed in the bone marrow and in the spleen. So when you get an overproduction, for whatever reason, of red blood cells, your hematocrit can go up very, very high. Well, when your hematocrit goes up, gets up too high, now all of a sudden you're not in normal, um, in normal osmolarity. You've got too many solutes in the bloodstream. So your patient gets... Um, they're at higher risk for clotting, they're at higher risk for stroke because they can throw thrombus because they're getting developing too many clots. So in the event of polycythemia, too many red blood cells, um, one thing that you can do is just tell your patient to go donate blood more often, which is it's a win-win. The American Red Cross needs the blood and the patient needs less of it. They have too many red blood cells, you need to thin it out and that's one way to do it is um, a lot of times patients that have that disease just go give blood more often. It's a win-win. Um, okay. Um, we're going to talk about the lymphomas and the leukemias next time. So let me tell you just a little bit about um, the anemias because that's really common. You're... you're your patient for you know they'll all be anemic you're probably anemic um so i want to tell you a little bit about that and then the next time i'll go into more details about stuff so so the anemias um start out i think that's like the first thing they talk about in chapter 33 um basically anemia oftentimes it's associated with some kind of okay a good one I'm going to have to not lecture in this spot again just because my dogs are obnoxious and my front door is right out there. Very irritating. Okay, yeah, so it starts out in chapter 33 um, talking about anemia and, and what it is. Basically, um, it's, it's low hemoglobin. Lack of oxygen is getting to the tissues because there's not enough red blood cells to carry the oxygen there. And it can be from a variety of causes. Oftentimes, if somebody is showing up anemic, there's something else going on. They might have a colon cancer. They might have a bleeding polyp in their colon. Sometimes, if it's up in their colon and they don't know that they're bleeding, like if they're not actively bleeding in the stool, they might not know it. Um, until they start, they come in and say, I've just been tired, I've been fatigued, I can't catch my breath. You'll do some blood work and find out that that hemoglobin and hematocrit are low, and now you start looking for places of bleeding. They could have a, a stomach ulcer that's bleeding. They can have um, a malignancy that they didn't know about. They, you know, they, they may just be chronically anemic. Um, they could, you know, a lot of your patients who are get undergoing, um, you know, therapies like chemotherapy and stuff like that, they're chronically anemic. So um, there's a lot of, of reason you could have bone marrow problems because, you know, the bone marrow produces the um, red blood cells. So if you've got a bone marrow disorder, that's, that can lead to anemia. Um, so a lot of times what they can do is... Um, you can put the pro, you know, tell the patient to eat air, to eat protein, to, um, oh, those dogs are really driving me nuts. Um, if I weren't pressed for time, I'd get up and deal with that. Um, the one thing with, um, anemia is, um, what was I going to tell you about anemia? Oh, pernicious. There's a difference between regular anemia is just, um, you know, uh, lack of oxygen on the red blood cells, and pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia is typically caused by a lack of intrinsic factor in 
the stomach. So when, when you eat um, iron and, um, and you need the iron to produce the heme, which is the, the heme part of the red blood cells that carry the oxygen, um, when you ingest iron, that crosses through the gut and gets absorbed in the gut and hence the you know, production of um, heme in the for the red blood cells. Some, but you need you in in the gut in the stomach you need an intrinsic factor to take the iron from the food and get it into the bloodstream. People that have pernicious anemia, there's a couple different causes, but one big cause is that they don't have intrinsic factor, also known as IF. So you can eat as much iron as you want, but if you don't have intrinsic factor, it's not going to get into the bloodstream, which is why people who have pernicious anemia have to get B12 shots. You can't just take a B12 vitamin um, and hope to improve your anemia. You have to get a shot because, because you have to bypass the gut. You've got to get it into the bloodstream a different way. That's why you get a B12 shot. They do also have... Um, nasal sprays are coming out with B12 nasal spray, so it goes into the vessels in the nose. Um, and but typically, um, and that that's pernicious anemia. But the symptoms will be the same. They'll have fatigue. Um, they'll have uh, trouble. Not I don't want to say trouble breathing. It's not like pneumonia. It is just like they feel like they can't catch their breath because there's, you know, they keep breathing and they're just not. They feel like they have to suck in more air because their body is telling them they don't have enough oxygen in there. Um, so usually somebody who's anemic, it's either a destruction of the red blood cells for whatever reason, or their body's not producing enough red blood cells. Um, so, oh, here's another thing. This is pretty common. When your patient is diagnosed with anemia, the, the simple treatment of choice is iron. You put them on an iron pill because iron will increase heme. Um, and you can get over the counter easy peasy drug great drug the problem with iron is it's it's best absorbed on an empty stomach but iron on an empty stomach can cause nausea so a lot of people can't tolerate it and so then they'll just stop taking it um, so if somebody can't tolerate iron if it makes them nauseated they can take it with food but it doesn't it um, it's not absorbed as well so they may have to increase the dose of iron to get the same effect while it's minimizing the nausea so you might have to play around with the iron a little bit and keep that in mind um, sometimes if a patient can tolerate the nausea for a little bit if you can give them the iron and have them wait at least 30 minutes and then eat that helps a little bit um, Sometimes if you can give them, um, you know, like, uh, like a little bit of orange juice or something like that will help um, increase the absorption of iron. Um, some people that are anemic can, if, if they still have intrinsic factor, folate and vitamin B12 are great drugs to help, um, help increase um, red blood cell production. Those are awesome. Um, but if if a person is chronically low and getting too low in red blood cells and they're severely anemic, then you may have to just transfuse. This is the patients that you actually have to transfuse with um, packed red blood cells in order to get their hemoglobin and hematocrit back up to where you need it to be. When your patient starts getting anemic, besides um, having difficulty um, uh, breathing, I hate that word. It's kind of like, it's like almost like an air hunger, like, you know, like, like sometimes when you just like, like have to sigh, it's like that all the time because they just, they have this air hunger. They also have a lot of pallor, like if you pull their eyelids down like this, they, it's not nice and pink underneath, it's real pale. Um, their skin looks pale just because they, they're not, you know, they don't have as many red blood cells floating around there, so they just look pale. Unlike people who have polycythemia, they can get red-faced because they have too many red blood cells. It's opposite in anemia. Um, and if it gets too bad, they, then you can start seeing neurochanges, confusion, and stuff like that. Um, so 
One easy thing to do is, is guaiac the stools in your patient who are chronically anemic and you can't figure out why. Um, guaiac the stools and see if that tests positive because it could be they have a bleed somewhere higher in their GI tract. If the, the, there is a bleed higher up in the GI tract, the stool will be dark. It's called melon. Um, so that's one indication. You can ask your patient, guaiac the stools, this, and it can come back positive. Even before you guaiac, you can ask about the appearance of the stool. If it is dark, um, it's like melon, melon out of color, that is like a bl black tarry stools, that means they might have, be bleeding. Here's the thing. Patients who are taking iron, a side effect of iron is dark tarry stools. So you don't want to ask somebody who's on iron and if they've been on it for a while, what do their stools look like? And then make the association, oh, they might be have a GI bleed because it's probably associated with the iron. So that get, you might that gets a little bit tricky to sort of decipher which one is um, going on. So the other anemias are the hemolytic anemias. Um, those are bad. The hemolytic anemias are bad. Hemo being blood, lytic meaning um, destroying, destruction of. Um, that means the red blood cells just keep getting destroyed. Those people have shortened lifespan. That's a little bit of a trickier anemia to deal with. Um, the aplastic anemias, A meaning, um, meaning none or absent of, um, plastic is formation. So that means like like no red blood cells are being formed, that's a very serious, very serious, um, and I don't mean red blood cells, I mean, all. if you have aplastic anemia, your, your patient is not producing red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets, or significantly reduced. So that is a very difficult problem to um, deal with because all of the blood cells are not being produced. Um, the, your kidneys... Um, produce erythropoietin, which is necessary for the production of red blood cells. Um, so if your kidneys, if there's kidney damage or there's something wrong with the kidneys and they're not, the kidneys are unable to produce erythropoietin, that can also lead to some of these anemias. Um, and so if you can fix the, the renal problem, kidney problem, great. If not, um, sometimes you can give erythropoietin shots to people, and we'll talk more about this next semester when we, when we go into the renal system, but you can give somebody a erythropoietin shot if the cause of anemia is um, a, a lack of erythropoietin production. Um, there's also some megaloblastic anemias um, leading, this can lead to pancytothemia, meaning pan meaning um, all-encompassing. Um, and a lot of these, again, you can just treat with folate or vegetables, high green leafy vegetables. Diet is huge in these patients. Sickle cell anemia is, um, there's uh, table 33.2 I wrote in my little notes here. Sickle cell anemia is um, a genetic problem that shows up predominantly in African American um, communities. And that is a, I thought I saw, oh yeah. Over on page 909, there's that, see that figure um, 33-2? See how the red blood cell should be a nice round red blood cell? And the sickle... I, I apologize. I'm going to I'll rethink this next time. I'll the, um, the sickle, see, goes like that. And the problem is, if you have sickle cell anemia, um, those... Those red blood cells, they start sickly. They, it, it's almost like a beaver dam. They kind of get lodged together. And what happens is they usually get lodged way down in the um, microvascular system. And they create clots. Um, and you can have a lot of end organ disease. So they, they create clots. And then the, the blood can't get through there. It, it stops the oxygen. So then they start having all kinds of end organ complications because the oxygen is not getting to all the organs that it's supposed to. So they end up having a lot of um, uh, renal failure. They have, look at this guy on page 913, figure 33.3. They have like skin ulcers. It's extremely painful. When, so it's like a genetic disorder and you, the, the um, role of the nurse is to prevent the patient from sickling. So, and you do that by keeping the patient very well hydrated and avoid infection because those are some triggers that can make the sickling worse. 
So, keep, you know, lots of fluid. They should not be around anybody who's sick. They should try to stay healthy. If they do start getting sick, probably have to call their doctor. May need to be hospitalized to put them on IV fluids because you want to prevent the sickling from happening in the first place. Um, so, that's sickle cell anemia. Thalassemia is rare. Thalassemia, this disorder is seen mostly in the Mediterranean population, um, the like the, the Greeks, um, you know, sort of like that the the people that live like in the Mediterranean area, and they have really little um, red blood cells, so they tend to be, um, uh, you know, have like a almost like anemia just because they have red blood cells, but they're really tiny. Um, so it acts like an anemia, um, and um, you don't. The rest of these, like like glucose six phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, it's like three people in the world that have that. You don't need to know. Don't don't bother. Know about it in the back of your head that it's another kind of the disorder, but it's very rare. Don't spend a lot of time on that. Um, the immune hemolytic an anemias, again, very rare. It acts like the rest of the anemias. The cause is different. It's more of an autoimmune problem. Um, hematochromatosis, hemo being blood. Um, ptosis is a condition of, that's just too much iron is being absorbed from the GI tract. You want some iron absorbed, but when it gets to become too much, then you have too much iron in the blood. And again, um, those those people, you know, if they go um, donate blood more often, sometimes that helps. You want to keep them hydrated. And obviously those people, you're going to want them to eat less iron. So they need to be cautious of what foods contain iron and not have iron. Okay, we talked about polycythemia. And polycythemia, too many red blood cells, very high hematocrits. Again, keep them really well hydrated. And then um, they may need to um, offload blood just with... Um, phlebotomy is a donating blood and stuff like that. Typically, polycythemia is an overproduction of erythropoietin from the kidneys, so it, it stimulates the production of red blood cells too much. Um, neutropenia um, is not enough white blood cells. This You'll see this a lot in your chemotherapy patients. They become neutropenic or leukopenic, low white blood cells. Those patients are very high risk for infection, so you have to keep them away from people that have infections. Good hand washing. Um, so, and then thrombocytopenia, um, platelet destruction. Um, okay, I, that's all we're going to do for now. Um, I think I told you the words. I wanted you to know some words. Um, hematopoiesis, production of red blood cells. We talked about that. Fibrinolysis, a breakdown. A break, lysis is a breakdown. Fibrin is clots. A breakdown of clot is fibrinolysis. Thrombosis is the development of clots. Sometimes we want that but not too much. Uh, thrombocytosis, an increase in the number of platelets. That's going to put your patient at risk for clots. If they throw clots, now they're at risk for strokes, um, PE, DVTs, things like that. Okay, let's, um, let's call it good. Um, thrombocytopenia, did I already tell you about that? I wrote down in my notes, table 33.3. Um, you should know, look at table 33.3. The causes and treatments of thrombocytopenia, that's low platelets, high bleeding risk. Um, so, you know, like patients that have leukemia and stuff. So if you can fix the underlying cause, sometimes you can fix um, thrombocytopenia. Um, so we will talk next time. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the different kinds of thrombocytopenia. Um, and DIC, we'll talk about the next time. So that's good for now. That's it. That's the over like hematology in a nutshell and that's that'll get you through uh the first part of hematology and then i'll do some more um hopefully tomorrow so okay again sorry for the delay i know you guys have been waiting for it but there you go okay